Praise the Lord, everybody. I'll come over to you. Praise the Lord. I hate no Lord. The Lord. The Lord is strong and mighty. The Lord that provides and protects. The Lord that gives help and strength. The Lord that watches over us. Takes care of us. Oh, I thought he had some children in here. The Lord that makes the way. The Lord that steals the storm. I'm going to be talking to somebody that they know who I'm talking about. The Lord who holds your hand. Guides your mind. The Lord who guards you while he guides you. I wonder if there's anybody in here that knows that God of ours. Who hears and answers prayer. Who knows that if I had not been from the Lord on my side, I'd been cut off and gone a long time ago. Don't deserve it, but he did it anyhow. And I praise him and thank him. If you can stand in the house this morning, you got to reach one reason why you can put your hands together and clap and tell God, thank you. All you got to do is just think about your journey. How he has kept you alive, saved you from hurt, hunger, and danger. I thought he had some children in New York, man. If you got hands that are worth your life, just give them a hand.
Good morning. Good morning. May we all stand for the reading of God's Word. This morning's scripture reading, once again, will come from the book of Psalms. Psalms 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him, and were in light, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Yeah. Blessed be the king that yeah. trust in him. Yeah. I read to you Psalms 34, verses 1 through 8. May God add a blessing to the readers and the hearers of his holy yeah. and precious word. Yeah. You may be seated. Let us look to God in prayer. Oh God, it's once more again we come before your face. Oh God, thanking you for life, thanking you for health, thanking you for strength. Oh God, you have been so kind to us. You've been better to us than we could ever be to ourselves. Oh God, we thank you for allowing us to see a new day that's been coming this way since creation. Oh God, you have provided provisions for us, not just last week, but even today. Oh God, you gave us strength to walk through our homes, to dress ourselves, to clean ourselves up. You even provided food for us, oh God. Oh God, we thank you for safe travel over the dangerous hour. Oh God, to just come to your house to praise you and to thank you. Oh God, it's not about us, but it's all about you. Oh God, we come for friendship. We come for her individually and we come for her collectively. Oh God, she needs you right now. She needs you more than she ever did before. Oh God, there may be someone here who don't know you in the free pardons of their sins. But oh God, you can save them today. And we trust and believe that you will and can do it. Oh God, bless the sick, bless the afflicted. There are so many people suffering to the game, and only God you know about it. We thank you for those who are sitting in the seat of sorrow. Touch them, oh God. Lift their bow down hands. And then, oh God, today when we shall receive thy tithes and thy offering, we ask that you would bless it, oh God. Sanctify it, oh God. And then, oh God, we don't want to forget the shepherd that you have placed here. Touch him, oh God, that he may speak your word to a waiting congregation to know what's new and what's fresh from thee. Help us, O oh God, and keep us close. In the mighty name of Jesus, who is the Christ, and for that sake we ask. Amen. We make ready to receive our benevolent offering. Pray that you will make ready to give in the benevolent offering. Amen.
lessons that we don't deserve. Yes, Lord. I know that we have had certain bulletin structure and we have included some matters back that we once were engaged in doing and that's all right. And sometimes you gotta make a return and we're making returns back to aspects of our worship and thank God that we can do it. Amen. Amen. The Bible speaks of the tithe being holy unto the Lord, separate unto the Lord because he is worthy and deserving of it. We're going to take our benevolent, I'm sorry, our tithes and offerings, our ushers are aware of how we are to do it. I'm going to ask that you would please follow the instructions by the ministers of order. We're going to start on this side first from the rear coming up and then once we've gone around then we're going to ask this side if they would please uh, stand and come around. We're not allowed by the CDC or by the Deputy Health Director to just come and converge and because of that there is another way and that is we can do it side by side. Right. Amen. And however it's received in the choir and the balcony, the ushers are aware, I'm just going to ask that you would please be obedient. Father, thank you for making resources available to us. And we thank you that you allowed us to be able to live this long, to have them, and to use them to your glory and honor. Thank you for every person who gives today. We pray that you would meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory. And even those that are watching, please let them know that they can still give, though they are where they are. Thanking you for their heart and their kindnesses as well. In Jesus' name, amen.
that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Lord, I ask that we would stand prepared to sing the hymn of preparation.
turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 14 through verse 22. We will read the text and preach as much of it as the Lord helps us. Revelation chapter 3, last book of the Bible, verse 14 through verse 22. And when you find it, would you say amen? amen? I'll be reading out of the New American Standard Version of the Bible and I pray you leave your Bibles open. Pray you brought your sermon the notebooks with you that you will take note of the word of the Lord so that in days to come you can refer back to it because it will still be a lamp under your feet and a light on your path. Amen. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the amen, the faithful and true witness. The beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may become rich and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, take a good look. Listen carefully. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me in, on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And let us read that classic verse that is reverberated through these seven letters. Let us read it together. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You may be seated. And I pray that you will stay in the house to hear something. We want to talk from that series of texts, the Lord's message to the church at Laodicea. Yeah. The Lord's message. Not John, but Jesus' message to the church at Laodicea. I want to thank you for being a part of this preaching moment, those of you that are watching and those of you that are here who have assembled for these last few weeks. We have worked our way through this series of letters. And today, we look at the final letter to the church at Laodicea. And we've discovered that in each of these seven letters, there's both a description of each church. And in those descriptions, all of which the Lord discloses or he shows them by way of diagnosis, that which fell under his scrupulous eye. Like a doctor in a hospital making his rounds, visiting his patients, Jesus does the same in the life of these seven churches, making his final stop to the church at Laodicea. Yeah. And Laodicea, geographically, is the very last one on the circuit. None are left out. Jesus makes determination, not from the outside in, but from the inside out. Not from what the church thought of themselves, but how he saw them. And it's amazing how when you listen to the words of the Lord and how he viewed each of these seven churches. Let me back up and share with you his observation. The church in Philadelphia was called the Faithful Church. The church in Smyrna was called the Suffering Church. The church in Thyatira was called the Adulterous Church. The church in Sardis was called the Dead Church. And Laodicea, not left out, was called the Disgusting Church. And when you read this letter, there are several facts that stand out about this church. 
Because they were wealthy, because they were materially well off in their own eyes, where it really mattered the most. And that's not materially, but that is spiritually. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says to them that they are bankrupt. They might be doing well downtown at the bank, but where it mattered in the eyes of the Lord, Jesus saw something else. There was something that their money and their materialism could not buy. And this was the only church out of all of the seven that Jesus spoke to, listen to this, that he didn't have nothing good to say about them. And facts about it, this church, according to the text, out of Jesus' own mouth, you are seen in the book. Where the Lord says, you sicken me. You make me nauseated. Did you hear that? I mean, can you really believe the Lord saying to a church of all things that you make me sick? You know, we used to say that to each other from time to time when we got mad. But the Lord, the Lord is saying, your brand of religion sickens me. Yes, sir. Imagine that. People that went to church every Sunday. Are y'all walking with me? They got good clothes on. They took a bath. They got good cologne on. You know, they, 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 they feeling good about themselves, but the Lord ain't feeling good about them. You, would he say that to any of us individually in here? You know, it's one thing where we get a letter that, that speaks to a whole church, but that's just isolated to us today. Would the Lord say that about any of us here and those of you that are watching, that the way you live makes me sick? You got a name, and that's about as far as it goes. Your lifestyle sickens me. And then the question becomes, what are you going to do about it? You know, I, I watch TV like you, and, you know, they go through those emotions on Pepto Bismol about how the coach is stubborn. Yeah. The Lord ain't talking about Pepto Bismol today. The Lord is talking about people who have looked at themselves and have left him out. Well, let's walk through the text. Because we want to at least look at two aspects of this text today. We want to, as we have in the past for the other six, we need to do the same for the last, the seven. Because first we would look at is the description of Christ. How does, how does Jesus describe himself? And in verse uh, 15, uh, 14, nine, he describes himself by saying he's the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Well, what does all that supposed to mean as it relates to the church? Each description that he reveals himself in these letters is actually a description that fits the need that each church has. And in those descriptions that are described and the needs that are addressed, we find the Lord being the solution to the problems that the church has. Let's look at it. First, Jesus says that he is the what? The amen. I want you to talk back to me today. He, he is the amen. And for those of us that read the word of God, students of scripture, we know that the word amen means so be it. Now, I want you to look at how it's written because it's not in lowercase letters. It's in large case so Jesus is not talking about something, he's talking about someone. And that someone is himself. And he makes this personal designation that he is, listen to this, a faithful and true witness. That he is the amen because Jesus is the verbal affirmation of agreement of everything that God is. Everything that God is, you're going to find in Jesus. He comes to not only confirm the word of God, 
But it also comes to confirm all the promises of God in himself. And it's amazing how he identifies himself as the Amen. Because in doing so, he exposes the deception of their identity. Here was a church that prided itself and bragged about its financial strength and the goods that it was known for. But you don't find Jesus bragging about nothing that they brag about themselves. In fact, the body of Jesus speaks to this church and he makes them aware that as they amen, that everything that they are is because of who he is. And what a needed message for the church today, beloved, because failure to do so will only breed a personal boasting and self-centeredness. You and I are not self-made nothing. If we are anything, if we have gotten anywhere in life, it's only been because the Lord has helped us. I want to say to you that you ought to see yourself larger than where you live, what side of town and house on, what's inside of it, the car that's out in the parking lot, the money that you got in the bank in your IRA, your Roth, or your 401k, whatever it is. If you say that is all that makes you you, I hate to tell you, but I will. There ain't much to you. Because any fool can get everything we just said and still don't understand that it came from the Lord. If you are receiving a check, whatever it showed up, it's because the Lord let you live long enough to receive those resources. And please understand that we are nothing without you. We must never forget the second statement Jesus makes about himself is that he is the faithful and true witness. Do you see that? Yeah. Which helps us to understand that he is not a fraud, he is not fake, he ain't phony. He is the bona fide real thing. He is real. His power is real. His person is real. His purposes are real. His salvation is real. His sanctification is real. His glorification is real. Heaven is real. And hell is real. Which says that you never have to worry whether the Lord is going to lie. The Lord is never going to tell us something just to make us feel good knowing that it ain't true. Whenever the Lord talks to us, rather than copping an attitude, we ought to tell him, thank you that you got me on your mind. Hello in here, somebody. Through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, because it didn't always make us feel good. Sometimes those tears coming down the side of our face ought to be tears of conviction. To thank God that He did not let us get away with sin in our lives. Yeah. But then the third statement Jesus makes concerning Himself is that He is the beginning of the creation of God. Now, here's where Jehovah's Witness theology has gotten it all messed up. God didn't make Jesus. Jesus has always been with the Father. I know I got at least six folk in here who read the Bible. Who, if you were to go back to Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God. And that word God in the Hebrew is the word Elohim, which deals with the plurality of God. He is our God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is not some three-headed monster as others would say he is. Thank God for being God who created us. Thank God for Jesus who saved us. But then thank God for the Holy Spirit who keeps us. I don't know about you, but I'm glad for all three of us. Jesus is not suggesting that he was created, but rather he is declaring that he is the source of the origin of creation. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, you might want to write that down in your notes and read it later, but I'll read it to you while you're here. He affirms that this fact about Jesus is a fact because the writer of Hebrews says, In the, these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Jesus is telling the church, in your complacency, you need to know this. 
And that is, is that all that you have comes from me. Without me, you can not only do nothing, without me, you can't have anything. Go to school, get a good education, but whatever you do, you need to remember. It ain't about being lucky because you graduated summa cum laude. You ought to be thankful that you graduated. Thank you, Lord. I know you ain't going to be no graduating class on that. But for those of us that are saved, we got to thank you, Lord. Even if we couldn't put birds together splitting adjectives and adverbial clauses, but thank God we know how to talk. We can stand, we can look, we can see, we can hear. And the only reason why I'm going to have some death is because the Lord has helped us. Thank you for resources, but resources do not remove the power of Christ in our lives. You do know you can have a king size bed and still can't get a, a twin bed mattress worth of sleep at night. Oh no, you can have a house but ain't got no home. You can have a car, ain't got nowhere to go. You can have money and it still won't buy you happiness. And then we move, we move from this description of Christ to now where we get to the heart of the preaching text which deals with a diagnosis of the church. Very few people like going to the doctor. And very few of us want to hear bad news. Imagine Jesus showing up at the church of Laodicea, the first Baptist church of Laodicea. And he says, you know what, y'all? I need to talk to you today. I got some news I need to share with you based on what I see. I am happy. Yeah. And I want to tell you, when the Lord ain't happy, nobody ought to be happy. In verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. I'm sorry. In verses 15, 16, 17. Jesus makes a startling announcement to a church that believed it had it going on. Can I tell you today, the Lord can care less about how many you can see and how big your church is and how big your parking lot is. The Lord can care less about how much money you got and how many folk you got on the road. That don't impress the Lord. He wasn't impressed with them. And he could also not be impressed with us. Down at the bank, they, 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 they had a lot going on, but when it came to the Lord, Ah. Like a doctor making his rounds, the Lord visits the church and he lets them know on this final stop at Laodicea that he got some problems with them. From society's perspective, Laodicea was known for several things. It was known for its financial strength. Laodicea was a wealthy town that was known as a strategic banking center. And yet, listen to this. After there was an earthquake that occurred in AD 60, rather than get help from the government because they were so financially solvent, are y'all listening? They were able to rebuild their own city out of their own pocket. They were famous for soft black wool. But they were also famous for our shall medicine. And all three of these industries, finance, wool, and our staff, came into play in this letter. And it's in this environment that the church is set. But there's something else you can consider. And I'm sure I tell you, because they are absorbed in and around what's going on, what's happening in the city got in me. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It, it resulted in deplorable, a disappointing report by the Lord. Yeah. Jesus confirms it in verse number 15. Watch the text, beloved. Because the Lord doesn't say anything about their money. He doesn't say anything about their medicine. He doesn't say anything about their black wool. But rather, he makes a stern parallel statement about what they have become spiritually. Yeah. Listen to this. In comparison to their condition, their water supply has fallen in as well. 
Look at verse number 15 and 16 with me. I know your deeds. That you're neither hot, cold, or hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I need you to think about this while we're just talking. He mentions and pulls in their water system. There's a reason for that. Because Leon's water system supply was the focus of the Lord's tension because, watch this, in parallel fashion, that's how he saw the church. Because that's the state or the condition that they had fallen into. If y'all miss it, why don't you just raise your hands so I can see it. Amen. Praise his name. Let me explain the situation. You don't mind, do you? Six miles north of Laodicea was a city known as Harappa. Hierapolis had what was known as hot mineral springs that provided extremely hot water that was used for medicinal and healing purposes. Now, six miles away, it had to get there and it wasn't coming in cups and buckets. So in order to get the water, I wish somebody would say, holler, holler back in the preach passion. Thank you so much. The Laodicea, in order to get it six miles away, down to, yes, Laodicea from Hierapolis, they had to use what was known as an underwater aqueduct or pipe system to transport the water. But that was a problem. By the time the water got from Hierapolis, six miles up, coming down to Laodicea, there was a problem. I, I promise that y'all finish preaching this, but I'm going to do it myself. By the time it got there, the indictment is that it is neither cold like the water at Colossae, and it wasn't hot like it was when it left Hierapolis. Somewhere between departure and destination, the water had cooled off. And while it had cooled off, it couldn't heal nobody. And facts about it, the indictment was, it was repulsive the drink. Come here. Now he ain't talking about the aqueduct system. He talking about the church. The Lord is saying to the church that you have become like your own water system. You become stagnant. Yeah. You become lukewarm. Yeah. Are you ready for this one? Uh -uh. And he also said to the church, you ain't good for nothing. <laughs> he is saying to them that they were no longer a place where people came to be healed and refreshed. Yeah. That they were a dispassionate and disconnected people who had no positive effect on the kingdom of God. Wow. So close. But yet so far away. Six miles ain't that far away when you got the right piping system, but somewhere between it left hot and got where it didn't take all day for it to get there. When it got where it was going, Lord have me preach your word. It had gotten cleaned off. I wonder between the time you left the house this morning. Until the time you got to the church. Would that sound like you? Did you come up in the house of the Lord with some cold, stagnant, lukewarm attitude toward the worship of Him who's been keeping you all this time? Have you made your way out of the sanctuary to avoid the sermon because you might just be lukewarm? So close, so far away. How much of that depicts people even now during COVID? So close to the building, but yet so far away from worship. So close to Walmart, but so far away from friendship. So close to Giant Eagle, but so far away from 1954 Brunch. So close, close enough to go 
sit with Ellen Lebo, shop with, go to Boston, so close, but so far away from Sunday morning worship. So close to be there when they open the door, but never close enough when we open them out. We're so far away. Can I just keep preaching? The description and the condition of the water situation at Laodicea, not as the citizens here, because remember, this is not a citizen survey. This is the Lord talking. The Lord saw it. And it was an accurate description of the state that the church had fallen into. And in light of all that the city was famous for, it didn't impress him. Jesus points one major weakness concerning every citizen in Laodicea who knew it all too well because it had adequate water supply, but it wasn't working. Because yeah. it didn't have a local water supply. It had to be pumped in from Hierapolis, as I told you, but again, by the time it got there, started out hot, started out boiling, but when it reaches destination and they are sheer, the water had to come lukewarm. Come here. Would that picture fit any of us today when it comes to our commitment to the Lord's church? Started out hot. Oh, but now I ain't got to. I cooled off somewhere in between the time I was on fire for him and just a few days later. What about your Christian service? Has your Christian service, has your Christian commitment fallen into a state of lukewarmness? What about your reading the word of the Lord? Yeah. Has it fallen into a state of lukewarmness? Is it every now and then or when you need something or when trouble is on the horizon, now it's time to get on bended knees? What about your prayer life? Has your prayer life gotten lukewarm too? So the warning of Jesus here merits our attention in two ways. Two ways because first it's a message to the entire church, which means that nobody is left out. Yeah. Yeah. But then certainly you can't talk about a body of people without dealing with individuals at the same time. So the Lord is saying to every individual, even us, some way, you have gotten lukewarm. And you know, the wonderful thing about it is that he's been making us aware of what it is. But the question becomes, what have we been willing to do about it? When you consider the strength and the seriousness of the Lord's message to this church, it almost leaves you speechless because it needs you to think about this. Let me go here. Because the Lord's warning and the message to the church here is this, and that is beware. Be on guard concerning your self sufficiency. Beware. Because no matter how well you may think you may be living and doing financially or in any other capacity, don't lose your sense of me and depending on me. Because there's some things that are going to show up in your life your education can't solve and your money cannot buy. Material things will come and go, but God will stay the same. He's the only one that is a forever constant. Your friends are going to come and go. They're going to get shaky and flaky. But our God is a God who's going to be with us in the best of times and in the worst of times. He alone is completely trustworthy. And so the first call of the spiritual And please listen carefully to what Jesus says, not only to them about them, but give some attention to what he says about what they, he's about to do to them. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it didn't scare you when you read it, so maybe I need to buy it up. Yeah. So here it is. You're not hot and you ain't cold. I wish that you were either one or uh, the other. If you were cold, I'd heat you up. If you were hot, I'd make you hot. But because you've fallen into a state of lukewarmness, wait a minute. What? Wait a minute. 
I will, not I might, not could. Maybe, maybe y'all get the reverberation of that. Yeah. I will spit you yeah. out of my mouth. Yes, now here's where it gets serious. He didn't say, I'm going to stop your money from flowing. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Yeah. The Lord can let you have your money and you still be miserable. Here's where it really gets serious, beloved, because here's where I raise this question. How do you fall into such a state of self-deception and you don't know? How do you not know you have not cooled off? How do you not know and the Holy Spirit ain't said nothing to you yet. Maybe the spinning out is already taking place. How do you fall in a place like this and not be moved to do anything about it? And the fact of the matter is, is that the environment that they are in has clouded them to the reality of what they have become as the Lord sees them. And that's why the church has got to keep it under and, and, and understand that we are not like the folk in the street. We don't live like the folk in the street. We've been saved. We've been rescued from that kind of lifestyle. And we can't live better. And expect the worship clean. Did you listen to what Jesus said about what the conceited condition that they in? I make none of this up for trying to thank you for helping me. Look at verse number 17. He said, Because you bragging, you say, I'm rich. I become wealthy. I don't need nothing. And then the law says, as much as you think you got, you ain't got as much as you think you have. He says, because the truth were to be told, not from them, but from him. He says that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Lord, help me preach your word. While, while they flirted and flaunted about their wealth and how great they were doing, Jesus says, you really don't know how broke you are. The Lord points out four conditions that they are in. You see them, don't you? Look at verse number 17. He says that they are wretched and miserable, poor and blind. Number five, and then he says they look they're naked. These are personal and pointed criticisms. And what is sad about their condition is not so much the condition, although it is sad. But what's even sad is that they don't have a clue as it relates to the reality of their condition. They fail to realize the condition that they have fallen in has affected their fellowship with the Lord. Mm. Yeah. They believed by being self-deceived. Yeah. That they had it all together. That they were in absolute control. That they were self-sufficient. When the Lord says, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. They said that they didn't need anything. Yeah. Whoa. Mm -hmm. But Jesus says that you're in need of everything. And he lists what they were in need of. Yeah. Jesus says that they were wretched, yeah. miserable, Poor because their material riches could not buy them spiritual riches. Yeah, amen. Remember, they all see it was a city for medicine. They had one of the best eye ointments for treating damaged eyes. But watch this. But yet Jesus says, your eyesight don't even work. Uh -uh. He, he, he says that they are black because they don't have any idea of how spiritually their vision issues are. They were a center for fashion and, 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 and they sold some of the finest black wool garments that money could buy. But Jesus says, mm -mm. Yeah. <laughs> He says, You're naked. Yeah. They were financial centers, they had great banks, and yet the Lord says, You're broke. Yeah. We may flatter ourselves, beloved. We 
may deceive ourselves, but the Lord sees us and knows us as we really are. We may impress other people, but God is not impressed by our impression of the phone. It is a tragedy. They didn't know it. And it's interesting how we see ourselves apart from what Jesus says and the way he sees us. And beloved, here's what it really matters the most. You still praying for me? Yes, sir. It's not my assessment of me. And it's not your assessment or evaluation of you. It's not how you see yourself. But it's how the Lord sees you. The Lord's assessment is what matters the most. Does anybody care how the Lord feels? And as you sit with yourself today, let me ask you this question. How does the Lord see you? <coughs> you. You. Y'all. How does he see me? And in light of how he sees us, do we care enough to change them? Yes, I've been taught in preaching class that sometimes pause is powerful, so I, I want to go ahead and take full advantage of what I got taught in school. Maybe I need you to marry me up. Process. <coughs> How does See Friendship Baptist Church. Yeah. You say, well, I ain't a member of no church. You ain't excluded. <laughs> you, you don't get off the hook. I, I, all I do is I just show up whenever I show up. Oh, you, 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 if you claim Jesus yeah. as Lord and Savior, you part of this conversation. Yeah. You may not have gone where your membership is, but you, you and I are going to get off the hook. How does the Lord see you and I as it relates to our service to the church? Are we available for everything outside and unavailable for ministry inside? Because here's where grace and mercy intervene in the message to the lay out sins, but here's where grace and mercy has intervened for me and you. Jesus warned them before he took action against them and he lets them know in no uncertain terms what he would do if they stayed the way they are. Wait, I'm just saying that for <laughs> Stay the way you are and face divine consequences. Yes, Keep living the way you live. <laughs> Keep talking the way you talk. <coughs> and face oncoming consequences. Yeah, yeah. For those of us that were involved in Sunday school this morning, thank you, Holy Spirit, for bringing it back to my mind. We, we, we read where in the Old Testament, uh, Numbers chapter 16, in case you want to you can read it for homework, where those folks were coming up against Moses and uh, and, and, and rising up and doing everything they wanted to do. And God uh, told Moses, uh, let them know I'm going to meet them tomorrow. Uh, and let them know I'm going to get them too. <laughs> Ground opened up, swallowed some of them, and then anybody ever, anybody here go to Sam's Club and get that little tips for chicken? They ain't good. I mean, for five hours, you can get a whole chicken already cooked and seasoned. On that day, they had no tips for repeating. Because God's word, 250 of them walk. You say, oh, that was back then. And God was, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Same God. Oh, God would do that to me. You ain't God's poster child. Those who God love, God will get after. Oh, God, we ain't walking so right. We ain't walking so upright. We ain't living so holy. Where we ain't, we aren't in need of chastisement. But I praise God today. I gotta take the call off. I'm sorry, I don't have a lot. That God has not 
God the judgment ain't fell on us yet. Take everything you said in this message today very serious. Because it is. Because it might be the last time that he's going to send a warning like this. And though he spoke to the church, the congregation as a whole, I need you to know, don't lose sight of that because he's speaking to each one of us individually. Let's for a moment take attention to the message that he gave to them. And then based on his knowledge of you and I, what does the Lord not only see, but what does he say to us, but what does he also say about us? You got your Bibles open and I'm, and I'm, I'm, head, I'm heading toward, toward the finish. Look at what he says in verse number 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anybody hears my voice and opens the door, I come into him and will die with him and him with me. We often use that as evangelism. That's great, but, but, but this is not some evangelistic appeal here. The door he's talking about is to the heart of the church. Y'all still do me. The Lord says, I've been knocking on the, your heart. I've been seeking to try to give. You know it's me. But you ain't opened the door yet. You won't open the door. But you leave me on the outside. Here's where it is tragic. That the Lord says to his church that I'm not inside of you. I'm on the outside. What? Thank God for great musicians and great choirs, but if God ain't on the inside, it ain't nothing but noise. Thank God for great leaders for great people, but if you ain't on the inside, if you ain't in the pool, it sounds good, but it means nothing. So I want to ask you a question today. Where's it at when it comes to you? And if he's on the inside, then you ought to have good fellowship. But you can't have fellowship living in disobedience. And then he ends like he started with the church of Ephesus, with the church of Sardis, with the church of Pergamos. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What the spirit didn't say make them feel good. What the spirit says to the church. What a great word of God today. What a great word of God today. And all of us in here individually need to do some soul searching. You ain't even coming to pray me in Bible study. What's the problem? Yeah. yeah. Have you got any room? Yeah. What does your prayer life look like? Not just you talking, but does he talk back to you? How about you reading the word of God? Not just reading it, but living it. Jesus says, I will spit you. I don't know. I can get along with get out get along with a lot of things. I've had to learn in my life how to, how to have some survival skills. Somebody ought to help me right there. But there's one thing that I know for sure. And that is that I ain't gonna try to learn how to live or get along without the Lord. I don't know about y'all, but I need it, Lord. I'm about to have some children. I need it to help. I got to have some help up in here. If that's the case, then we need to make sure we say to the Lord, if I've got a new wall, fire me up. If I've got a new wall, heat me up, Lord. Fire me up. And I'll walk for you. Yeah. Fire me up. And I'll save for you. Fire me up. And I'll testify for you. Fire me up. And I'll heal for you. Fire me up. And I'll do nothing. 